Good morning. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. Have you ever taken a look at our list of federal holidays? And it's it's not a long list because federal holidays are special. Whatever Ted Cruz may have had you thinking last year, we don't shut the entire U.S. government down for just anybody. If you are among those who sacrifice and dedicate their lives to the safety and security of our nation, we take a day to say thank you for your service. If you are the only first president of the United States, congratulations, you get a holiday in your name. The point is, if you make this exalted list, it means our country recognizes a contribution so significant and pivotal to our nation's history that we must all stop for 24 hours to pay tribute. And there is only one other individual for whom we reserve that level of collective commemoration, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. For the last 27 years, the third Monday of January has been the day of national remembrance for the man who embodies the movement of nonviolent protest that sparked a transformative civil rights revolution in the United States. Each year at this time, we revisit the images and moments that have by now become as familiar to us as our own family photos. King shoulder to shoulder with members of the movement on the march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama to campaign for voting rights. Martin Luther King Jr. smiling and greeted with a kiss by his wife, Coretta Scott King, as he emerges from a Montgomery courthouse. And of course, Dr. King on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, inspiring thousands of listeners on the National Mall with his dream. But what is it about our nation's relationship to King that we forget when we think we're just remembering? Because the years have, have wrapped those black and white images in a kind of bubble of sepia tone nostalgia. When we strip it away, we find a much more complicated relationship between King and our country than the one we commonly recall. After all, it wasn't until 2000, 17 years after President Ronald Reagan first signed the law establishing the holiday, that MLK the day was recognized by all 50 states. Now that states with a little s. But Martin Luther King was also seen as an enemy of the state with a capital S. The Federal Bureau of Investigations Director, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, is widely reported to have had a personal animosity bordering on obsession with King. And despite King's philosophy of nonviolence, Hoover feared he'd become a so-called messiah who would unify and galvanize a movement of militant black nationalism. Beginning shortly after King publicly criticized the FBI for failing to protect activists and black citizens, he became a prime target for the FBI's covert domestic intelligence program, more commonly known as COINTELPRO. According to FBI archival documents, quote, from late 1963 and continuing until the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., King was the target of an intensive campaign by the FBI to neutralize him as an effective civil rights leader. In the war against King, no holds were barred. The FBI's relentless surveillance of King up to the moment of his death sought to embarrass and discredit him and to neutralize the power of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. King was subjected to investigations of his inner circle, wiretaps and monitoring to expose alleged communist activities. In one instance, he was sent a tape recorded copy of extramarital affairs along with a letter that read King. There is only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. There is but one way out for you. You better take it before your filthy, fraudulent self is bared to the nation. The SCLC interpreted the letter as an attempt to blackmail King into taking his own life. Now I was reminded this week of how the threads of this history tie our nation's past inextricably with our present. When I heard President Obama say this during his speech on Friday. In fact, even the United States proved not to be immune to the abuse of surveillance. And in the 1960s, government spied on civil rights leaders and critics of the Vietnam War. In fact, during the course of our review, I've often reminded myself I would not be where I am today were it not for the courage of dissidents like Dr. King, who were spied upon by their own government. All right, did you catch that? Did you see what he did there, tying those threads together? President Obama is acknowledging that his presidency would not be possible without the man who was targeted for surveillance by the very state, capital S, that the president now leads. Of course, that was a brief moment in a much longer speech about the real reason that compelled the president to address the nation this week. He was responding to the national outrage that ignited after Edward Snowden exposed the NSA's surveillance practices. 
in this pivotal moment for the future of the United States national security, the president laid out new rules for how the NSA will collect surveillance information from this point forward. But in invoking the history of King and the FBI, President Obama raised a much older question that stays with us until this day when it comes to the use and abuse of state power against American citizens. How far is too far? Joining us now is Khalil Gibran Mohammed, director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Elahe Izadeh, who is staff correspondent at the National Journal. Earl Katagas, Katagnus, Katagnus. Katagnus, who is professor of history at the Valley Forge Military College and an Iraq War veteran, and also a military historian. And Marcus Mabry, who is the New York Times lead blog editor. So nice to have you all here. Thanks for having me. So Khalil, let me start with you as the historian. What does that history that I tried to lay out, at least in part there, teach us about the surveillance state in which we now live? Well, it teaches that we don't learn our history, history lessons very well. <laughs> so the FBI document that um, revealed so much of this, so there's a task force put together uh, in 1977, mm -hmm. and it reports on essentially what happened in the King case, mm -hmm. and it makes crystal clear that first the allegation of communist infiltration in the movement was already on thin ground from the start. Then one of King's trusty advisors, and I think this is really brilliant, that he himself had renounced the Communist Party earlier because it wasn't doing enough to help the race problem. <laughs> right. And so the very reason for the FBI's justification for going after King in the first place was discredited by their own investigation of his primary advisor. And therefore, by 1963, according to this task force looking back, mm -hmm. there was no legal justification for any additional surveillance. Therefore, it tells us something about how there is a pretext for mm -hmm. investigation. Once that pretext has established that there's no legal ground for that investigation, it's over, but it didn't end. Okay, so, it went on for six years. So I love this, and I, I want to I draw out exactly that thread, that idea that the, that the issue and the thing I think that causes us always to pause when we realize, oh, wait a minute, Dr. King was under this kind of surveillance. Now we have a federal holiday to him. Is this notion of the groundwork, the reason that we would engage in surveillance, particularly on an American citizen? Is there something that you heard in what the president said this week that suggests to you that we are going to be shifting, Earl, our understanding Understanding of what constitutes the reason that we would be listening in. No, nothing from the president. Mm -hmm. What the president said. I think the president, what he did uh, uh, was uh, what an executive does, and he's actually uh, looking towards Congress. I think for legislation on this, and he's uh, uh, he's left a lot of room for maneuver in this in this speech. One, he def said emergency, and words like emergency need to be defined, and they can't be defined through executive order. They have to be defined through legislation. Uh, also, he's uh, trying to redefine this issue of national security in the 21st century. This is something that was done in the, uh, in the 20th century with the anarchist movement and the first wave of modern terrorism, mm -hmm. uh, with the, uh, uh, where we see this worldwide assassination attempt that even Theodore Roosevelt uh, said that the, the new scourge of the earth is anarchism and that it has to have a war on, on an anarchy. Uh, and we have to, as nations, come together. So he's trying to redefine that uh, in here. Uh, I do not think that he has the case. I think that this is a, a recurrent theme all the way back yep. to the early republic with the Sedition Acts, and where if you speak out against the government, that immediately the yep. state itself will then coalesce around itself to, uh, to support it. Right. And, and, and so, so I, I don't want to miss that, because I know, you know it's easy to get caught in the weeds of any particular historic moment and to get, you know, to talk specifically or exclusively about Edward Snowden. But, but Marcus, I do want to push this a little bit, because this idea that all the way back, that what states do, states with the capital S do, is they protect their monopoly on the legitimate use of violence, force, and coercion. So if you are either suggesting that their use of violence, force, and coercion is illegitimate, or if if you are challenging the monopoly because you are actually raising your own uh, you know, capacity for force, then the state will, as a matter of being the state, is going to respond back. And so I, I wonder, like, given that that is the core of what a government is, how then democracy is meant to check that and what we can begin to think about in terms of rethinking our privacy in connection to security. Well, it's interesting because the president tried to acknowledge exactly that conundrum, right? Mm -hmm. So he started off by saying, we have a greater capacity, thanks to technology, in the U.S. state to actually 
go farther in invading people's privacy, not just here, but around the world than ever before. And he even suggested that largely this power is unchecked. Mm -hmm. So no one can check it except for us. Mm -hmm. And so he actually acknowledged that there is this problem. And I think coming from, as he does, a progressive background, that is <laughs> quintessentially a philosophical problem. But yet he had to deal, he had to balance it out with the realistic problem, the actual reality problem in the world we live in today, in which we do need to do a greater deal of spying than ever before, it is believed by the experts in intelligence, to keep the nation safe. Now, where do you draw the line? And so he acknowledged that there's this conundrum. Now, the previous administration didn't even acknowledge there was a conundrum. Mm -hmm. They said, there's no choice here. You can trust us. Yeah, so right. he, he did acknowledge it, and that's something. But the problem I see here is I don't think it's going to satisfy either side. Mm -hmm. I think the intelligence community will say this is not enough for us having to go to court more often to get some legal, you know, a, as these laws are worked out by Congress, to get some legal justification and, and of why we must be able to tap here or there. That's going to slow us up and make the country uh, more uh, threatened. Uh, and the other side of it, the, so, so, ironically, the civil libertarians and also the, 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 the libertarians uh, too cool, as a French would say, the Rand Pauls of the world, are going to say that yep. this doesn't go far enough on their side of it. So I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what we solve, unfortunately, yep. with this tr trying to split the difference. So I, I want to take a quick break, but Eli, I'm going to come right to you as soon as we get back, because I want to suggest that we also uh, are only looking at one set of institutions and having anxiety about one set of institutions when it comes to privacy and that we need to expand our concern. And that, in fact, we heard a little bit of that from the president, yes, uh, earlier this week. Stay right there. Up next, it is not just about who is checking your information. It's also about what they're doing with it. So stay right there.